Matthew chapter 26, if you would go there with me and look down at verse number 3, let's do it together. Lord, Lord, may the word change me. And it would say this, then the chief priest, the scribes, and the elders of the people, they assembled at the, at the palace of the high priest. Here they are together, who was called Caiaphas. And they plotted. They plotted to take Jesus. They plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. This was not a game. They were looking to kill the Son of God. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Already we see that there is a plan to take the very life of Jesus. So if you look down at verse number 14 and it says, Then one of the twelve who was called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and he said, What are you willing to give me? I want you to ponder these words just for a moment. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And as you look at that verse, I want you to ask yourself this question. How many people walking the planet today have walked into a bar, walked into another person's bedroom, slipped a needle in their arm or whatever it may be, and they've said to this world, what will you give me if I deliver him to you? Yeah. <laughs> how, much, how dangerous is it if we gain the whole world yet we lose our soul? And here we find an, uh, yet another person saying, what will you give me if I deliver him to you? People walk away from Christ every day because they look at the things this world has to offer and they ask that question whenever they look at the world, when they look at money or whatever it may be, whatever your thing is, when we look at our stuff and we say to our stuff, what, what world are you willing to give me if I backslide and walk away from God? And, and they counted him out. 30 pieces of silver, and in those days, this would have probably been about a half a year's wages. So from that time, church, please look at this verse. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Look at that line. He sought opportunity to betray him. I don't know about you, but I have difficulty even pondering this in my mind. This, this, this verse, and there's a lot of verses I can take you to Revelation, verses that just mess me up. I, and and there, there are verses that are hard to grab. You guys know what I'm talking about? But this verse, look at this. From that time on, he sought opportunity to betray him. The treachery of a traitor, a man who stood with Jesus, is now looking for an opportunity to betray him. But it doesn't stop there. Look down at verse 47 in the same chapter. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude of, with swords and with clubs, they, they came from the chief priests and the elders of the people, not my elders. <laughs> now his betrayer... If you just grab this story, his betrayer had given them a sign. And the sign was this, whomever I kiss. Wow. This is not just a normal, natural kiss. This is an intimate, brotherly love kiss. In these days, men who were like brothers greeted each other with a holy kiss. Yeah. Judas did not only look for an opportunity as the Bible has already told us. He did not only look for an opportunity to betray him, he betrayed him in a brotherly trust. He betrayed him even in an intimate way. You could, you could compare this with a spouse who has uh, committed adultery on their spouse. This is the most intimate form of betrayal that you can find. And, and it says that he, he looked for an opportunity and, and he says the betrayer gave them a sign, whomever I kiss... He is the one, sees him. This, this is not the soldiers giving the commands. This is, this is a disciple. This is one who walked with Jesus saying, the one in whom I kiss, he, he is the one that you will seize and he is the one that you will take. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings. 
Makes you want to slap somebody, doesn't it? Amen. Greetings, Rabbi. <laughs> this day, that's people's way of hugging you in church and saying, I love you. And he kissed him. But Jesus said, friend, check that out. Still calling him friend. Friend, why have you come? Why have you come? And then they came and they laid hands on Jesus and they took him. And, and suddenly one of those who was with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew a sword, struck the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. But Jesus said, put down your sword, put down your sword for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father? Check this out. This, this is your Jesus. Do you not think that I can, can pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could this scripture be fulfilled that it must ha that it that it happened thus and and in this hour he said to the multitudes have you come out look at this have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs i sat daily with you he's telling the soldiers i sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me but all of this was done that scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. Judas betrays him with a brotherly kiss and Jesus tells him to put down his sword because that's not what the kingdom of God is about. It's not about swords. And Jesus looked at these soldiers as if Judas had to give them a sign who Jesus was. They already knew who Jesus, everybody knew who Jesus was. And Jesus even said, did I not sit daily with you? And you come out to the garden of Gethsemane and you treat me as if I'm a robber and you treat me as if you, as if you did not know. But isn't it funny that the elders of the church, the, the Pharisees and the sad you see, decided that it was time to kill Jesus. And, and this story, if you will grab this story, this story by itself will change your life. And uh, as the as the elders are deciding that they need to get rid of Jesus, suddenly it is one of the people closest to Jesus that all of a sudden says, what will you give me to betray him? Can I tell you something this morning? You can only be betrayed by the people who are closest to you. You can't be betrayed by a stranger, but those people who climb into the pew beside of you in ministry and, and they, they tell you how great you are and no matter where you go, I'll follow you in ministry. Those are the first people that when they can stomp on you to get ahead, they will certainly put your neck on the ground and decide that they no longer care for you. I, I've got friends all over Fairmont, honey, who have done just that for, to me and I've got friends all over the country and if you are in ministry you also will have people that will look for an opportunity to say to another ministry to another church to another organization to another woman to another man to another job to a $20 bill what will you give me what will you give me to betray this one but I'm going to tell you something this morning to all of those people who have betrayed me and been disloyal. I can't preach on your people, but I'll preach on mine. Let me speak to the camera, or maybe some of them are here this morning. Let me say something to you. You can only do that when darkness has creeped into your heart. He's going to preach some truth now. You can't be disloyal and you can't betray someone who is close to you and close to you in God unless darkness comes into your heart. I'm not talking about just leaving a church and going to a different ministry or leaving a spouse or leaving somebody else. You can only do those kind of nasty things if you allow darkness into your heart. You only commit an affair when darkness has entered your heart. You only cheat. You only steal things from your job when darkness has come into your heart. You only backslide. You can blame it on the church all you want. You only backslide when you have allowed darkness to come into your heart. Not part of the purpose of the sermon today, but there it is. You get it anyways. Judas 
is the most notorious and universally scorned of all disciples. His sudden change brings confusion and it brings a necessary need for us to understand why and what happened. How could a man who was in the presence of Jesus and heard the words of Jesus and saw the miracles of Jesus, how could that man be the one to go and say, what will you give me? If I bring Jesus to you, how is it possible for folks who have experienced the love of God, the presence of God, and the power of God to turn from God? Many pews are empty this morning from such people who've done just that very thing. I'm going to go ahead and preach Holy Ghost to you. I'm just going to do it anyways. I'm trying to stand here and say I'm not going to do it. I'm going to just do it anyways. People are, people are compromising the Holy Spirit of God. They are compromising the power of God. People that I know who were once, I say once, past tense, filled and baptized in the Holy Ghost of God, sitting in dead churches right now, using every excuse in the world. And the fact of the matter is they just enjoy having a set time to get in, and now they enjoy having a set time to get out, if I can be guaranteed. And, and they're sitting in churches where pastors are saying, uh, we believe in the Holy Spirit, we just don't preach it because we don't want to have people under that kind of pressure. My God, God put me under under that pressure put me under the Holy Ghost pressure of God put me under speaking in tongues put me under the baptism of the fire I don't ever want to be you see when you when you begin to compromise one thing in the scripture when you begin to compromise your walk with God when you begin to say that the gifts aren't important anymore you'll set it home my God this is not part of the notes you'll set it home telling me that you preached the gospel for 40 years but you no longer need to attend the church and you'll sit in your house and go to Jimmy Swagger on channel 344 all day long and you'll attend church Churches with no power, no glory, no spirit, and think to yourself that it's everybody else's problem. But the truth is darkness. We've got more churches today full of darkness than we do Holy Ghost. I don't know who that's for, but there you go. Judas was one of the 12. He was, he was one of the 12 that was called to be a, a disciple. There was Peter, James, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, all men called to serve God. Judas's name was common in the first century. It meant Judah. It, it, it was the meaning of Judah. It means that Jehovah leads, and Iscariot was his surname. Iscariot meant that he was the, the region that he was from, but take note that, 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 that it was believed that Judas was the only disciple that was not from the Gal Galilee area. And there have been, listen, let me just teach you this morning, there have been many desperate attempts to preach. I'm just going to call it a stupid ideology that Judah, Judas was never saved and never cared for Jesus. To say that he was never saved and never converted is just simply, it is simply wrong. And unfortunately, Judas obtained salvation, but later forfeited his sonship. He forfeited his salvation for greed and self-gain. I'm going to tell you this this morning. The ideology and theology of once saved, always saved will be proven to be an, a, a harassment toward the gospel of Jesus Christ by the time I get done today. Make no mistake about it. Hear my voice today. Make no mistake about it one can lose their salvation one can absolutely walk away from the love of God yes they'll blame the church yes they'll blame the preacher yes they'll blame everybody else every everything isn't it funny that everything else is at fault except you when you're walking away from God but I'm here to tell you this morning under the power and the anointing of God make no mistake about it you can absolutely give your salvation away and you 
you'll give it away to a devil while blaming everybody else for your I I cannot make darkness walk into your heart. Your spouse can't do it. Your church can't do it. Your friends can't do it. Only you, only you can allow darkness to come into your heart. Amen. But I'm going to tell you this. You can slide into darkness just as quick as you walked into the light, my friend. Make no mistake about it. You can absolutely give your salvation away. Matthew 10 and 1 says that when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power. Power. Now look at me real quick. What, look at the first line. And when he had called his disciples, how many of them? 12. 12. That means Judas was among the 12. And Judas, he gave power. You can't give devils godly power. You can't give darkness godly authority. At one time, Judas had power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease, just like the other 11. Actually, Judas was anointed. He was acting on behalf of Jesus Christ. He was one of the 12. It goes on in verse 8 in Matthew 10, and it says, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons freely you have received freely give Judas had this power after more than three years of association the disciples entertained no suspicion of Judas at all but it actually seemed that all the other disciples had total confidence in Judas because even at the last supper when the Lord said one of you will betray me all of the disciples begin to say after another is it I Nobody pointed a finger at Judas. So when the world tells you that Judas was never saved, you need to give them the truth. Matthew 26, 21 and 22, it says that I say to you, one of you will betray me. And there they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each one of them began to say, Lord, is it I? Nobody expected it to be Judas. But at some point, Judas began to change. And he shut up his compassion for the poor. 1 John 3, 17, but whoever, 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 whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in needs and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? If you go into the story of, of Mary, Lazarus' sister, he, she was anointing the feet of Jesus with, with a very precious ointment just a few days before our Savior's death. And Judas complained and he rebuked the offering. His distorted view was that it could have been sold and used to care for the poor. But John affirmed that this protest had nothing to do with caring for the poor, but it had everything to do with Judas being able to get some gain. John 12, 4 through 6, and it would say this, but one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who what would betray him, said this, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? Why wasn't it sold and given to the poor? This he said, catch this now, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And had the money box. In other words, Judas was the treasure for the church of the Lord Jesus and the 12 disciples. Judas held the money. Make no mistake, most oftentimes the things you hold on to the most will be the things that will call you to fall the fastest. But he was a thief and he had the money box. Now catch this other line. And he used to take what was put in it. You see, you will, you will offer the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver for one of two reasons. One, you either want 30 more pieces of silver or you're afraid that they're about to take inventory and they'll find out that you have taken most of what has been put into the money bag and, and Judas was willing to sell out a Savior. 
His protest toward this offering was powered by greed. He was a thief and he took what was being collected. This anointed, God-fearing disciple had been overtaken with the idol. I'm going to use the word idol a lot today. He had been overtaken with the idol of money and greed. And on Tuesday before the death of Jesus, Luke 22 says that Satan entered Judas. I'm about to mess some of your theologies up this morning. I'm about to talk to you about someone who was once saved and they walked into darkness. Now they were possessed by a devil. So if that's going to freak you out, just go ahead and put your seatbelt on right now because it absolutely happens. I'm going to say it again. Luke 22, 3 through 6 says that Satan entered Judas and then he met with the chief priests and the, and the captains to strike a bargain for the betrayal. And Judas yielded to satanic influence he began implementing thoughts that he had once only entertained a thought became a fantasy let me preach to somebody this morning a thought became a fantasy fantasy became desired destiny desired destiny became the new goal thought fantasy and desire Thought, fantasy, desire. Am I talking to anybody? Birth, a self-seeking and self-pleasuring idol. The things that you find pleasure in are sometimes the most dangerous things in your life if you don't know how to control those things. I'm not about to get into your politics of your churching, but that's absolutely why I am against more and more churches allowing more and more of the world into the church because I'm going to tell you something. The more you cling to the things of the world, you're going to wake up one day and realize that there's more of the world in the church than there is of God in the church. <clears throat> Thought, fantasy. And desire burst, a self-seeking and self-pleasuring idol. His idol, his idol was money. And money was now in, more important than Jesus. There will come a day where your idol will be more important than Jesus. He said, well, preacher, I'm sitting in church today. I, I don't care. I know what it's like. To witness people be under the power of God and still serve idols. There's a lot of people who sit in church service after church service, but they have idols when they go home. I'm not going to preach on, I'm not going to name them today, but you, you can do that yourself. Whew. When something in your life is more important than Jesus, it's an idol. Amen. Two days later at the Last Supper, John 13 observes that the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. It wasn't Judas's idea. Let me say it again. John 13 and 2 says that at, at, at two days later at the Last Supper that the devil had already put it into the heart. You want to know why people can go into a school and shoot it up? Because Satan puts it into their heart. You want to know why people can go to Las Vegas and shoot up hundreds of people because Satan puts it in their heart? At what point in time does Washington, D.C. stop trying to interview politician after politician and gun owner after gun owner trying to figure out why these things occur? It does not occur because a human hates another human. It occurs because we allow darkness to come into our hearts. That is what causes people to do things. How can a woman walk out on a man? How can a man walk out? on a woman it's not because you just suddenly decided to be attracted it's because we fall out of love and all of these things but the seed that was originally sown will always be a seed of darkness John 13 27 and Luke 22 conclude that Jesus had been lost to the satanic powers of darkness all the good that was previously in Judas was now lost it was now lost even though listen to me even though Judas did not know it the God power that was in him was now gone you can lose it without knowing you've lost it 
You can lose it without knowing you've lost it. How? What's a sign, preacher, that I'm losing it? When all of a sudden, I'm going to say it one more time, when all of a sudden you begin to find all these little problems with everybody else and the church and all these other things, you might want to start taking an inventory. I'm not saying that's always the case, but Judas lost it without knowing it was gone. Now, he wouldn't have lost a piece of silver without knowing it was gone. You wouldn't lose a complaint without knowing it was gone. You would. Judas was now lost to the disturbing, destroying power of darkness. Judas was now no longer in control. A son, once full of light, now full of darkness, walks the shallow paths of Gethsemane. Bloodthirsty soldiers follow close behind, waiting for the opportunity to, to, to attack a chosen prey. They seek to kill an innocent man that all he is guilty of is love. Full of idolatry, full of greed, full of demonic depression, Judas betrays the Son of God with an intimate brotherly kiss with 30 Pieces of silver in his hand. Judas stands by a tree calmly, counting his silver as soldiers violently. They begin to chain and beat Jesus, and Judas is just counting his money. And the soldiers take Jesus, and they lead him to the council to be tried as a criminal. And Judas is crutched up to a tree, holding on to his precious, his precious silver. Amen. God, I feel God in this place. Judas clings to his silver in a state of ecstasy while fantasizing of the ways his new found treasure will bring him fulfillment. You see, when the enemy begins to cause you to walk away from Jesus, he will not, he, the devil won't let you walk away empty handed. He will find something that will fill your void before you start walking away. But it doesn't take long for the news to spread about the arrest of the Jews' king. Uh, this state of ecstasy quickly comes to an end in the realization of the actuality, the noise. Can you hear it? The noise just around the corner. The noise that they are beating Jesus. The noise that they are mocking Jesus. The noise that they are blaspheming Jesus. They're scourging him. They are torturing him. And suddenly, somehow in the darkened depths of his soul, son, somehow Judas finds remorse. The tormented reality that Jesus will, will in fact face death is too much for his troubled soul to bear. In remorse, catch this now. Now that the job's done, Judas wants to go back and he wants to attempt to return the silver. The religious leaders are unimpressed. They refuse his return and, and they cheer his success. They cheer his success in single-handedly handing over Jesus, this so-called king of the Jews. Now, now the church. You see, when I say religious leaders and the elders, I'm talking about the church. Now the church is cheering the betrayal of a disciple. Whether you believed in Jesus or not, it's, it's a bad day when the church is encouraging betrayal. It's a bad day when the church is looking for blood. It's a bad day when the only thing that keeps us on the straight and narrow is preaching that sin is against God. And that bad day is when Churches who have been led into darkness in Fairmont, West Virginia, want to go to the newspapers and begin to say, we support the all-inclusive agenda that's flooding this nation. You see, we once thought it was the big cities through, throughout our country, but honey, it's knocking at your front door. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but half the churches in Fairmont have now officially said, sin? What sin? We don't see no sin. God 
God loves you anyhow and any who, no matter how you are, come to my church. I guarantee you that you'll never hear sin preached on in my church. I'm telling you, it's a dark day in this world when we suddenly begin to cuddle up to the darkness and the sin of the ages. I can tell you this, that one day soon and very soon, the trumpet of God is going to sound. The dead in Christ is going to rise and those churches that are full of dead Christians are going to find themselves still here on a Sunday morning and they're not going to know what happened. What happened was the true believers, those who were willing to say no to the world, have been caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so will we forever be there. But the scary part of this is those who have accepted darkness. The scary part is those who are walking into dark churches and dark rooms and they do not even know that the light of the Holy Ghost has been turned off. My goodness. The laughter of these religious leaders brought Judas confusion. I should be enjoying my 30 pieces of silver. I should be lavishing and, and enjoying the fulfillment of this newly obtained idol. But somehow, once, once the devil's got you to walk away, once the devil's taught you to quit church, and once the enemy's caused you to backslide, suddenly you realize that there's a deeper void now than there's ever been. Why? Because the devil was lying to you the whole time. His unstable mind, once thinking clearly, now clouded by the voices of darkness, telling him the soon outcome of his actions. Jesus will die, and it's your fault. Yeah. This is what the devil does. The devil told him, you will be stoned, Judas. They will kill you. You'll never be able to live around here anymore. When the enemy begins to play mind games, isn't it funny how the same devil who brought you to such actions is now condemning you for what he compelled you to do? That's one of the best definitions you'll ever hear of what the devil does. The same devil that brings you to your actions is the same devil that will condemn you for the actions once it's done. And then when he's got you totally blind, he will tell you that the church is horrible because they're preaching on the thing that's killing you. Don't go to the church. They're haters. Judas is now tormented within his mind, believing believing lie after lie, and now he believes that what's done is done. His new fantasy, his new fantasy is now immediate death. He knows just the place. He knows just the place. There's a tree. Some of you are about to identify with what I'm about to preach to you. <clears throat> Suddenly, he can't handle it anymore, and he plops. There's a tree that sits just on the edge of a deep, rocky drop. He planned it out step by step as he sought the necessary rope. He climbed up the tree, tied the rope around the branch, tied the rope around his neck, and he hanged himself. Once he was possessed by a destructive lying devil, devil, silver was never the goal. The devil will give you silver, but silver will not be the end of your story. Satan wanted to destroy everyone who even considered following Jesus. Pastor Sheldon, will you just come by yourself and just play me something softly? Matthew 27 and 5 says, Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple, and he went out and hanged himself. Once he found the right place on, on the edge of the cliff, 
Once the enemy convinces you that you just ought to just take your life. The enemy wants you to think that everything will stop at suicide. But see, even for Judas, the story didn't stop there. Acts 1.18 in the Amplified would say this. Judas Iscariot acquired a piece of land with the money paid him. A reward for his treachery and his wickedness. Check this out. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle of his body and all of his intestines. Poured out. After he hanged himself, either the weight broke the limb and this happened, or he hung there long enough to decay. And his intestines burst. Judas is forever known as the son of destruction, the son of perdition, the one who, who betrayed. Check this out. The idiom conveys the idea of experiencing a destiny consistent with one's character. What does all of this mean? What does the story mean? What is the message I'm trying to preach to you? Sin is constantly seeking a way to creep in. Idolatry is always possible when we draw our strength from anything other than Jesus. We idolize what we give our strength to and what we draw strength from. Salvation can be forfeited. You may not even realize when the Holy Spirit has exited your premises. One doesn't suddenly decide to backslide. Hear me now, Christians. Hear me now, those of you watching on your computers and your phone. We don't just suddenly wake up and decide to backslide. It's a slow process when the Spirit slowly is uninvited and we invite more and more of the world in. One day, one day, maybe even when it's too late, you wake up and realize that the problem wasn't Jesus, the problem wasn't the church, the problem wasn't the people in the church. You slowly walked away from your first love one small slow step at a time and before you know it before you know it you find yourself in a place that you had no idea you were even going you wake up and sin is now in charge while the former passion for Christ can no longer be found and you beg to find the answer to the question, how did I get here? I've been inches away from losing my salvation before, before I realized that somehow hurt and despair had allowed darkness to climb into my heart climb into my spirit and thank God when I got to the edge of throwing in that towel somehow some way the love of God rescued me I'm not trying to condemn you I'm trying to let you know that it happens with more people than you realize the sudden lack of compassion didn't make Judas realize that something had changed the sudden lack of compassion didn't make Judas realize that he had lost his first love. Counting silver as they were arresting and beating Jesus did not make Judas realize he had lost his first love. Betraying the Son of God in the garden with a brotherly kiss didn't make him realize that he had lost his first love. It wasn't until Satan had convinced Judas of suicide, already convinced of suicide, then he knew, I lost my first love. And by the time he realized it, he was too ashamed 
He was too hurt. He was in distress. It was more than he could bear on his human shoulders to know that I will forever go down in history as being the man who betrayed the Son of God. But the fact of the matter is, he was the first, but he was not the last. There are people all across this nation, all across this world, people watching me right now, people maybe in this room, people who should be in churches all across this nation, who slowly walked away from the love of a Savior that saved them when they were a teenager. Maybe they felt like they needed to sow their wild oats when they were 20, whatever it may be. Judas may have been the first to walk away and say, what will you give me if I sell him out to you? He may have been the first but he was not and will not be the last but today I'm hoping that you in this room and you in the camera and everybody that watches this can maybe understand for some of you you're on the edge and you didn't even know it for others of you you are in fact Judas Matthew 7 22 and 23 Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, iniquity, there will be people stand before God just as Judas and say, but Lord, I was a pastor of a church. I was a choir director. Lord, didn't I, didn't I lay hands on the sick and see them recover? Didn't I see blinded eyes open? Didn't, didn't I prophesy? Didn't we cast out demons in your name and, and see many signs and wonders? And the Lord will have to say, depart from me. The only reason he says depart from me is there had to be a point in your walk with God where you lost your first love. Just because you can cast out demons now does not mean that heaven's your home tomorrow. Just because you can heal the sick 10 years ago doesn't mean that you're saved today. My salvation five years ago is not my salvation today. And what I have today, I've got to hold on to it so that it carries me into tomorrow amen and just because you've been in church for many 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 years does not mean that that's a guarantee i believe this to say that there was a lot of people in church that woke up and say lord why are we not in why did we not go in the rapture and he has to say depart how did judas betray the son of god he he somehow woke up one day and and a devil entered him <laughs> 